I so much appreciate the testimony that each of you have, have brought and the experiences that all of you who are attending are, are bringing to bear in this, in this effort. Uh, there's a vote underway in the Senate, so I have a question for each of you. Um, but probably, if I'm going to make the vote, which I need to, I'll, I'll ask that maybe take two minutes to respond to each question. I wanted to start, Ms. Tetong. Um, noting that in November, on behalf of this executive commission, uh, then uh, Chair McGovern and I sent a letter uh, to the UN seeking a UN investigation on the separation of Tibetan children from their families to these colonial boarding schools. Uh, on March 6th, there uh, was a report that the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights did do a study, uh, did not come from the High Commission on Human Rights, but, but the, from the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And it very much called for an end to the forced relocations and the state-run uh, boarding schools and had a, a, quite a lot of data. So one section of the UN has, has pursued an investigation. The question now is how can we take and push the UN to the next step? What's the most important next step that this uh, Congressional Executive Commission should push for. Thank you for the question and thank you also for your efforts uh, in moving this issue, changing this issue, uh, especially at the UN. I think if the uh, members of the commission could request the administration, uh, members of the commission, um, members of Congress, uh, could request the administration to really lead a coalition of like-minded countries in opposing colonial boarding schools at the United Nations, at the Human Rights Council and other international fora. I think that would play a huge part, um, have, make such a contribution to first getting this issue out there because it's been hiding, or the Chinese government has been hiding it so effectively. And second, for pushing um, other countries, to get, giving other countries the support they need to get on board. And I think there are a lot of, of uh, like-minded nations who have these histories of the um, residential boarding schools and these kind of policies that really have an obligation to lead together with the U.S., like Canada, like Australia, um, and others. Yes. Uh, th uh, thank you. And, uh, and certainly, w w this is uh, an agenda that we can continue to push for. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, in that regard. And uh, Mr. Gare, you talked in your testimony, kind of following on that, how we need a unified voice with our European partners. How can we best, best amplify the, these horrific circumstances, which, as I was saying to uh, uh, Chairman Smith uh, during the testimony, if you're just hearing the story and you weren't already familiar with it, it would sound like a um, dystopian world, uh, you know, a few centuries fr from now on some other planet, you know, in some sci-fi novel. All of these horrific circumstances that are, are going on. But it's here. It's now. We do know it. Uh, we hear it again. <clears throat> and... Um, the world becomes somewhat hardened to all of the circumstances uh, that uh, are going to awry. Uh, how do we build a stronger unified voice with our European partners? Well, I think there's a moment now. I mean, there's a high skepticism of China right now. And I think we have to take advantage of that. The Chinese have been very um, successful in promising separate deals with different countries. Um, there's, there hasn't been a unified effort against China. But I think there is a moment now that there's a, a, a high degree of, of uh, unhappiness and skepticism and a feeling of danger and fear of, of China at this moment, which is pretty universal, uh, and certainly with our European partners. Uh, um, I think this is the moment for the State Department, for the commission for for us for all of us you know to make those connections wherever we can um, uh, mr. McGovern and I have talked about this quite a bit and and uh, and uh, congresswoman speaker Pelosi also this is to me is is central to what we can do to actually change things the, the US the US Congress the US government the US people have been completely supportive of of the Tibetan cause, and there's, uh, and we continue to be very strong in what we're doing. These bills are very important, very powerful bills 
that are getting winding their way through Congress and have been achieved. The Tibet Support Act of 2002 is huge in, in declaring support for the Tibetan people and, and correcting uh, uh, many of the misperceptions uh, through the propaganda of the Chinese government. Now's the time to talk to our, our, um, our equals in Europe, to our friends in Europe, and say, look, this is the legislation that we have started with. And it's taken us decades to get here, but use us what we have done to get similar laws passed, similar legislation done in in UK and France and Italy. I was on the phone with the Italians today. We're going to be presenting many of these same legislations in Italy because there's a government there today that is incredibly skeptical of what the Chinese are doing in the world. So this is a moment to take it and take chances of reaching out to our friends around the world. Uh, thank you, Mr. Guerin. And I know this comes from your heart and from decades of, of advocacy. And um, we need more uh, American citizens uh, to join you as we are joining you in this advocacy. Um, it's just a tremendous effort, and let's seize this moment, as you have suggested. And Mr. Dorji, uh, you talk about the, the long arm of Chinese government and how they are essentially blackmailing Tibetans who are resident in the United States. Citizens. Tibetans who are citizens here in the United States. And this is a, a practice they're employing not just with regard to Tibet, but uh, uh, in kind of a broad scope of trying to suppress the freedom of speech here, both by, by threats regarding that person, but also even perhaps more effectively threats against their families back home. And you gave us a very uh, specific uh, e example, the name deleted to protect the, uh, the individual. But uh, it is extraordinarily hard to be an, an advocate when your family is, is being threatened. Uh, what is the single most effective thing we can do to counter uh, this type of blackmail against uh, Tibetan citizens and Tibetan residents, citizens of the United States, residents here, uh, when their families are threatened back home? Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, I remember about 15, 20 years ago, America was a very different place where there would be Chinese students studying overseas. Uh, there were all sorts of students here who were participating in political conversations. Um, when I was an undergrad, actually, on my campus, I've seen Chinese students even taking part in all the events, going to debates, they would come to Tibet events, they would come to uh, other political events without fear that, they, that somebody is watching over their shoulder. Things have changed a lot. And right now, I sometimes I work as a, a teaching assistant at Columbia University. And what I see on campus, and many campuses these days is very different. I've spoken to a lot of Chinese students, let alone Tibetan students and Uyghur students um, and Hong Kong students. Even Chinese students who, used, who actually have less reason to fear the Chinese government, even they are terrified of taking part in any kind of activity that might be deemed as remotely critical or even borderline uh, critical to the Chinese government. And I think if we can find a way to make the universities a little bit more responsible to their students, it's the job of the universities to protect their students, the free speech of the students, the First Amendment rights of the students, to take part in events they like to go to, to participate in protests, to uh, take part in dialogue, to actually even meet with Tibetan students without fear. Many Chinese students are actually afraid to meet with people like me or us 
right? Because they don't know who's watching. Because the consulates have actually extended some of their arm and tentacles into the university campuses. And I, I would really appreciate if uh, Congress and the administration can look into that particular problem which is happening across many university campuses, both private universities and public universities. Yes. And as an immediate measure, having establishing some kind of a, a hotline where people can report tips whenever they see these incidents. My friend and colleague who was in Canada actually was subjected to endless harassment and endless uh, hate speech, uh, intimidation. Even she received death threats uh, from from hundreds of people, and the number of comments that she received, like, you know, digital kind of harassment, um, she was really, really traumatized by that experience. And when I was speaking to her just yesterday, she told me her hope is that in the future, other people don't have to go through that kind of experience. I'm so glad you mentioned uh, the hotline. Uh, so I've been pushing the administration uh, to set up just such a, a hotline. And the um, reaction so far uh, has been modest. Uh, the first response I got uh, was uh, the FBI wants to just use their standard tip line. And I said, what person being threatened by folks overseas would call up a, a tip line that has to do with anything in the world, any crime in the world, not, n not knowing uh, how the information will be used, whether the person on the other end speaks Tibetan or speaks Chinese or, or understands how carefully this information has to be controlled, not to amplify the, the threat. And if we don't have a way for people to systematically report, then we're not getting just the, you know, it's not the tip of the iceberg. We're getting like, the, you know, maybe a, 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 a ten thousandth of actually what's happening in terms of, of the information we're securing. And I think for us to take on transnational repression, we have to get a, a huge understanding. There needs to be a transnational repression, a hotline carefully, carefully staffed uh, with multiple language abilities, multiple protections, with such confidence uh, that uh, people know uh, that it's not going to be hacked, that they're not going to amplify the problems by reaching out, that the uh, diaspora communities can circulate that information. And I think that would help us really see the, the full picture and be able to mobilize a much more aggressive uh, response. Uh, and um, so uh, uh, I, I, I floated that idea last year, and, and um, this is the first time I've heard someone bring it up, back up before the, the, before the commission. And I'm continuing to seek feedback on it and, and partnership on it. Uh, and uh, I, I hope we, because you can no longer be free here in the United States of America if your family is being threatened a, a, abroad. Thank you so Thank much. You.